I knew that there was this growing field called social neuroscience that was really looking at how we interact with other people and what is happening in the brain when that happens and looking at the way, you know, you're not just mapping connections inside people's brains, but you're mapping connections from you to other people and looking at how they affect your your cognition and your physiology and all of these things. And I thought that was fascinating. I also thought it was really interesting to be sitting at a neuroscience conference hearing them talk about friendship. I'm Casey Main, a jaded, hopelessly romantic, health-conscious party girl searching for meaning. And my mission is simple, to make life better for myself and for you. I believe real change always comes from within. And the Better You podcast was born to discover hidden parts of ourselves and our stories. A safe place where we have real, honest conversations with people from all walks of life to help better understand ourselves so we can become better versions of ourselves. So come along on this journey of discovery with me so you can become a better you. And welcome back to another episode of the Better You Podcast. I am your host, Casey Main. As always, the first thing I want to say is thank you very much for being here and for checking out the show. Whether this is your first time listening or you've been following along for a while, I just very much appreciate it. Your time is super precious and I understand that. And there's always like 18 million things you want to be doing at one point in time, which is usually how I feel. So the fact that I am high enough on the priority list for you to be listening just really, really means a lot to me. So thank you very much. I really love the conversation that I'm sharing in today's episode. It is just a super interesting and like scientific view of friendship and and why it's so important but also why we choose the friends that we do which i think considering everything that's going on in our country and i'm in the united states i realize some listeners are not but you've probably seen what's going on in our country i think it's really interesting to look at kind of why we bond with with certain people and, and why not? And that part of the conversation is a little bit more towards the end, but I think it's super interesting. We talk a lot about empathy and compassion and which is something we also talked about in the episode with Dr. Perlmutter, which I recommend everybody listening to, because it takes a very neurological standpoint of how our brains work in terms of decision-making and how empathy and the prefrontal cortex and all this cool science-y stuff. And so this is another science conversation, which um, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that um, I love those perspectives. I can be a little bit nerdy, but I think it's really important to understand kind of how our minds work in the different aspects aspects that are affecting them because ultimately how our brain is working is how we're making decisions and navigating life. And that's what's creating our life. So super interesting stuff, but we do talk about, or she does mention, you know, that we have this innate in group out group bias. And I realize some people are going to be immediately be defensive to that. Be like, no, I don't No, I don't. But if you understand, that's just kind of how our, our brains are wired. That's like the default setting being aware of that, like once we recognize it, then we can start to kind of work through it. And that's where, you know, empathy and compassion start to come in. And so I do think this conversation is relevant to everything that is going on today, as well as super interesting, just standing on its own. I do want to point out though, that this was recorded back in early May. So this is another episode that was recorded um, before the death of George Floyd and the protests and just everything that's been happening over the last couple of weeks. So I don't think we talk a lot about COVID-19, but any mention of kind of the current state is referring to that, not, not the protests and the Black Lives Movement and racism and inequality that hadn't, ha- well, it was happening. It wasn't what everybody was talking about um, at the time of recording this conversation. So just keep that in mind. And on that note, I do just want to give a quick update on kind of what I'm doing in that world. I've talked about this a little bit on the podcast so far. And so 
I'll be completely honest, and and I believe I said this in the my current events little kind of spiel that I aired. I felt very uncomfortable with everything, and uncomfortable with like what is okay and right and valid and respectful for for me to say. And I just really didn't know what my place was, if I even had a place. And so just really been struggling with it and feeling really uncomfortable. And, and it was that discomfort, as we talk about in so many episodes of this podcast, like that discomfort or anger or upset or any negative emotion that you're feeling, that is telling you something. And for me, I see it as, okay, that's an area I need to dig into for sure. If I'm feeling uncomfortable about something, if I'm feeling the desire to be silent about something, or if something is starting to make me feel like I'm not in the right place or fear of being judged, fear of being rejected, all of that. When I notice those feelings, I'm like, okay, there's something there to dig into. And I think that's true for all of us. So what I've decided to do, and I posted about this on my socials um, the other day, but at the time this airs, it'll be, I guess, last week. I I feel like I am very uneducated on the matter, Uh, more uneducated than I originally thought I was as I've started to educate myself a little bit more. So there's two books I've started. One is Me and White Supremacy, which is really more like a workbook, like a journaling workbook. And so I'm just at the beginning part now. I haven't started the first journal prompt. Um, That'll be tomorrow. But if you know me or if you've read my book, you know I love journaling and I love journal prompt questions because that'll really just get your mind going. And so I'm going to work through that. I believe it's 28 days. And then I've also started listening to the book White Fragility. And this was highly recommended by um, a guest that that conversation will air in the future. And I started it, I, I, it's my first Audible book. So I downloaded it on Audible, really having no idea what it's about. But it, the subtitle is, you know, why it's so difficult for um, white people to talk about racism. And I might be I might be off a little bit on that subtitle, but it's something like that. So I started listening to that just yesterday. I went for a walk. And so I got about an hour into it and oh my gosh, it's like already starting to blow my mind just from the introduction in the first chapter. And it just totally called out my discomfort and how that's, that's true for a lot of us. So if you are white and you're listening right now and you are uncomfortable, even with me talking about this then you definitely should consider reading this book if you're okay moving into that discomfort. And if you're a listener of the podcast, my guess is that you are because a lot of the work that we do on ourselves and better understanding ourselves and facing our past and all of that is is uncomfortable. Growth is uncomfortable. So I would just recommend every white person read this book. And I'm only the first chapter in, but it just already blew my mind with how like the definition I've had of racism in my mind is is not the complete picture by any means. And so it's easy for me to sit here and say that I'm not racist because I, I'm a good, kind-hearted person and I don't actively do mean things towards people of color, which is kind of what we've been taught is racism. You know, these just horrific acts and just outward blatant acts of of hatred towards other people. And She's starting to paint the picture that that's not the case and that it's a much bigger picture. And so I I know this book is going to be uncomfortable. I could tell just from like the introduction, but I'm actually really looking forward to it because I, and I talked about this a little bit in my social media post. you know, we all only know our own perspective. It's true for everybody. We, yes, you can practice empathy and attempt to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, but you only know your own perspective. Now, we also use that that concept in terms of like you are the expert of your own life like cuz nobody has lived every single second of every single day from your perspective other than you so you are the expert in your life that means everybody else is the expert in their lives so we can do all the empathy we want to try and put ourselves in other people's shoes but ultimately we're limited to only truly know our own perspective So while I might sit here and think that I am not contributing to the systemic racism in this country, as I sit here and have lived this extremely 
privileged life. And I don't mean privileged, just white privilege. Like I, I came from a good family, grew up in a great neighborhood, like went to a good college, good family, all the stuff I talk about in, in my book that, you know, I've lived this charmed life and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, but I'm also very aware of that and that that's what I know. And I know that I don't know what I don't know. So I'm super excited to continue to read this book to expand my knowledge and try to expand my perspective. It'll never be fully somebody else's perspective, just like nobody will ever fully know what it's like to be me. But I think the more we try that, the more empathy we can have, and then that's how we can best work through all of this. So I wasn't really expecting to go on on that little rant, but at first I wasn't going to, you know, kind of go down this road and really recommend anything for anybody And honestly, I do believe everyone, you are where you are. And if you do not feel compelled to, you know, kind of read these types of books or educate yourself more on the matter, then then that's where you are and okay. And that's kind of where I was because I thought I knew enough. And but the the discomfort, if you're feeling discomfort right now, I think that's telling you something. And so I think it's a road worth venturing down. All right. So that's that. I will go ahead and climb back off of my soapbox. And I don't know if, if I, if, or how I will continue to address this matter moving forward. It might be little rants like that in the intro, just kind of update you guys on kind of what I'm doing. I might start airing more of those just random kind of me talking like I did on the take on current events a couple weeks ago. So if it's something you're interested in and want to tune into, you can. If it's something you don't want to listen to, you don't have to. I don't know how I'm going to go about it. Um, I'm just going to kind of see what what feels right. And as far as what's planned for next week's episode, we have we're jumping back into the spiritual world a little bit. So if you enjoy the spiritual episodes, we're moving back in that direction next week. And then I believe, so at the time of recording this, I believe I'm going to air a second episode this week. It is just a great, very lighthearted, feel good conversation about a really unique friendship. And so I thought it fit with today's episode, obviously, which talks about friendship, but also it's just, it's a light conversation. So if you're feeling the need to listen to something not so heavy, just a little bit kind of lighthearted, which, which is totally fine. Like if you're feeling pressure to constantly consume all of this heavy stuff right now, like just remember to to take care of yourself. Like self-care is still important. But I think it's a fun conversation, and it is with a woman, Judy Gammon, who has a new book out about her really kind of random and fun friendship that was formed with this woman, Lucille, who is a centenarian. So she's like 100 and something years old. And Judy and I met at a what's called like a pitch workshop when we were, this was a couple of years ago. It was in New York city. It was a weekend in New York city and it, we were both working on our books. So neither of our books were out yet, but we both happened to attend this uh, pitch workshop where they really help you refine your pitch to then pitch to literary agents to then hopefully get a publisher and that whole book publishing process. So we met there that's the only time we've ever really spoken or seen each other, but you know, we kind of clicked and then it was a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago, I get an email from her publicist pitching for her to come on the podcast. And I was like, Oh my God, I know her and her book is out. And that's so amazing. So it was fun to reconnect with her and talk to her about her book and her relationship with Lucille really just taught her a lot. Again, going back to perspectives, the perspective of somebody who's reached a hundred years old. I mean, imagine what they've seen in the, in the world, in their life. And so it just, it really changed her life a lot. And so we talk about that. So I believe I should have time to listen through that and send it to my audio engineer and hopefully air it either Thursday or Friday of this week, probably Friday. Um, but just make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss that. Okay. This is getting to be a long intro. I apologize for that. Let's go ahead and jump into today's guest. So Lydia Denworth is a science journalist and author of Friendship, The Evolution, Biology, and Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond. She is a contributing editor for Scientific American and writes the Brainwaves blog for Psychology Today. 
Her work has also appeared in The Atlantic, Newsweek, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Time, and many other publications. And in this episode, we discuss her interesting and personal journey into becoming a science writer, the evolutionary advantage of living in groups and being able to create bonds, the scientific definitions of friendship and how long it takes to develop true friendship, whether or not you can outgrow friends, the impact social media has had on friendship, the physical benefits of friendship and the evolutionary biology reason behind them, our implicit in-group and out-group bias and the importance of empathy, and why we choose the friends we do. All right, so that is it. We're going to go ahead and jump into this conversation with Lydia. Okay, so I definitely want to dive into all of the content in the book, but first I really, I'd love to hear more about your background because from the research I was doing, like I just, I'm really fascinated by kind of the, the evolution of your writing. So tell us all a little bit um, about your background and kind of how you got into this work. I have always been interested in writing. I, it, I never... I don't remember ever wanting to do anything else, but being a science writer is something else entirely. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much the last kind of writing I would have expected to be doing. I was that person who took the minimum amount of science possible in high school and college. (laughs) (laughs) I was, it was not my thing. Um, Of course, I regret that now because I'm so interested in it now. But uh, so I had a a career as a journalist for years. Um, I was a history major, so I was, you know, into English and languages and history and things like that. Uh, And there is a lot of history in my books. There's an element of history of science. So at least, you know, I came by that honestly, (laughs) I guess. Uh, But I. About halfway through my journalism career, I, I well, really with my first book, uh, which is an, ends up being about environmental science. It's, a, it's the story of a doctor and a scientist who were among the first to understand that lead was as harmful as it was, uh, both what it, that it was in the environment everywhere and that it was in ki- getting into kids' bodies at levels mm. that were not thought to be harmful, but turned out to be harmful. Uh, Anyway, I came to that book from an interest in health and education and children, but I came out of it a science writer because uh, of these two protagonists. The one, you know, was the the doctor that made more sense given my the kinds of things I'd been writing about before. But the other guy was a geochemist at Caltech. And in order to tell his story, I had to dig into all kinds of really technical journal articles that he'd written about the level of lead contamination in seawater and Arctic ice and things like that. And it was very intimidating, but it also felt fascinating and important Mm -hmm. and, you know, interesting, well, interesting, I guess, Uh, is the same as fascinating, but um, I... I was really taken with it and I although I was in, intimidated while I was working on it you know people seemed to feel that I had done a really good job of telling the science and explaining it including the scientists who were um I mean that particular Claire Patterson the the main protagonist had passed away but a lot of his colleagues and his wife read the book and um and the other the doctor herb needleman was still alive at that time and read the book and they were all thrilled with it and so i thought oh, well maybe i can do this <laughs> maybe maybe there is a place for someone who does not have a science background but you know essentially what i was doing was needing to explain things in a way that i would understand yes, <laughs> i had to learn yes. them well enough right so uh so from there i haven't looked back really and i've just gotten 
deeper and deeper into the world of science journalism. And now I've written three books and I'm a contributing editor at Scientific American. So I guess I'm I'm in it now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely are. I just, I find that so fascinating. And a lot of your story resonates with me. I, I was not, I did not have a career of journalism. I have found, well, I was always into writing, but I didn't pursue it in any kind of professional sense until just a couple years ago. But I find myself fascinated by science and even the history of things because it explains so much of like what we just think is normal and just accept as normal for today that maybe wasn't always, especially when you get into the you know health and wellness world. And I'm really interested in things that uh, like chemicals and, and ingredients that exist in our daily products that we seem to be okay with, you know, our food and all of that. So um, you got me thinking about my own writing path and maybe trying to to venture down a, a science component, but, but you're right. I think it's probably, it's probably a good thing that you don't have that total science background because you're able to understand the information and then communicate it in a way that all of us non-scientists can understand and relate to. Like, I think there's a lot of power in that. I, I hope so. I mean, there are definitely, there are Two kinds of science writers. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people, and many of them are very talented, who do have a background in science. Uh, there are people who thought maybe they were going to be working scientists and then uh, sort of veer into science journalism as another way to stay involved in science, or, or there are people who at least majored in it, you know, uh, some who worked in labs and have PhDs. And then there's then there are people like me who who don't. But what I really think is interesting that all writers can can take from this is the idea that um, that well, science is a story. It's it's mm -hmm. a you know it's a way of trying to explain what we know about the world and how why how much we know. There's always something you don't. I mean, it's a never. There's a beginning and a middle and no end <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's constantly changing. But as a science writer, one of the really big things you have to do is always keep in mind, is the writer, is the reader with me, right? Am I, am I carrying them along? And I think that that is something all writers can, could use a little, um, a little bit more of, or it's, it's a really good way to be mindful. You're forced to do it in science in a way that is different because there's more of an assumption that people won't know what you're talking about. Uh, Mm -hmm. or they might not they just might not be familiar but so there's that element of it that i think is universally applicable and i think that thinking about science as a story is also interesting because it does you know people shouldn't be intimidated i'm i'm exhibit a in um in the fact that you can you know, you can go in and you can learn things and you can, you can give what you do a whole lot more substance. Um, and people it's overused now, but everybody always talks about evidence-based this and that, but in mm -hmm. writing, it's just, it's just more that you're backing it up with facts and figures and, and, uh, I don't know, it's always appealed to me. I'm, I'm a very concrete, practical kind of a person. So I think that's part of what I like about it. Yeah. And that's a really good point about just in writing in general, making sure the reader is with you. Cause that kind of comes back to like connecting all those dots and really like laying it out for the reader versus assuming that they're in your head and kind of understand where your thoughts are going, which I think is something that I struggle with. And I, and I'm sure a lot of writers do is, you know, it, we don't know what other people don't know. So you kind of, what makes sense to you just seems normal, but to really spell that out for someone is like a whole other skill set. Right. What I really love about your work too is like I mean you're you're kind of across the board. So you have the book on lead and then you have a book on the science of sound and language and then now you have your latest book on friendship. So it sounds like you haven't really um kind of pigeonheld yourself into one area of science, you're into all of it. <laughs> well, that's sort of, that is sort of true. Yes. Or, or at least it looks that way. I feel like there's a more of a through line. I mean, one piece of it is that it's about where science meets society and, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I did switch from writing about environmental issues to writing more about the brain. And so that second book, has a lot of 
brain science in it because it, it's about my youngest son who's deaf and uses a cochlear implant. And so it was about, it's part memoir, part brain science, uh. and then part cultural history about the deaf world and the, and the controversy over technology and my, you know, the journey that I am taking in that book is as a hearing parent of a deaf child, sort of getting thrown into what feels like someone else's political fight, but, but isn't really, because as soon as you are, if you have a, if you have skin in the game at all, right, if you've got a kid mm -hmm. or you yourself or anybody you know and love has hearing loss, then you, then you're in it. And so, um, so it was, it was about all those things, but the, but the part that I thought I could really contribute was that because I was both a science journalist and a mother, I had this kind of front row seat to something that felt really important. And the science has bearing on the politics of it all. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a whole discussion about, you know, the people who object to cochlear, cochlear implants for children think that kids should you should wait until kids are old enough to make up their own mind about whether they want that. But the problem is that, that, that doesn't, you actually have made a decision because the brain is only kind of open, <clears throat> excuse me, for the experience of processing sound when kids are very young. And, mm. uh, and so you, you close off that possibility if you if you wait. And so anyway, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of it, but there's a reason why the brain was such an important part of that very personal story. And it was the thing I was exploring. And then that got me quite fascinated by the brain and, and neuroscience and the plasticity of the brain. And mm -hmm. that actually was the jumping off point for this new book on friendship. It was that I got after I finished the second book, I was sort of casting around for what to do next, you know, beyond my journalism thinking is, you know, do I want to write another book? And I knew that there was this growing field called social neuroscience that was really looking at how we interact with other people and what is happening in the brain when that happens and looking at the way you know, you're not just mapping connections inside people's brains, but you're mapping connections from you to other people and looking at how they affect your, your cognition and your physiology and all of these things. And I thought that was fascinating. I also thought it was really interesting to be sitting at a neuroscience conference, hearing them talk about friendship, which just wasn't obvious <laughs> somehow <laughs> to me that that's what they talk about, you know, because we all think of friendship as such a thing we take for granted in a way. Uh, and we also, th it feels very familiar, but it doesn't feel serious. Uh, mm -hmm. And neuroscience is about as serious as it gets, right? So I just, I thought that was an interesting tension and that maybe there was a, a way to write about friendship if to follow the lead of these serious scientists who were looking at it in a new way. And that was the book I wanted to write. But so I did come to it from the brain side of that last book that, um, but yes, it's true that then it turned out, yes, there is some brain stuff in the friendship book for sure. There's there's a, a good bit of it. But there is also uh, evolutionary biology and primatology and epidemiology and sociology and psychology and uh, lots of other stuff because, you know, there's a, a lot of different ways to come at friendship. But, yes. but the, yeah, but the goal was to, to, to keep it narrow banded to this kind of new scientific approach. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I, now I'm just even more excited about future books you will write, because I think that same concept, you're so right that like, we don't, we think about these different relationships and these kind of social elements of our lives. And it's like, we kind of have that in one bucket and then we have you know, science and biology in another bucket. And I think the majority of us aren't even really thinking about neuroscience because that's something we learned in like high school or grade school science. And then have just completely forgotten about, like, unless you're in a field where you continue to study that, but everything we're doing throughout the day and interacting, that is, that's changing our brain. That's impacting our brain. Our brain is then impacting, you know, how we're interacting in the environment. So I think connecting all those dots for people from a scientific standpoint, but then also 
like an, a, an evolution standpoint of like how it's changed and how that's impacted us and all of that. Like I, I mean, I, I'm fully aware that I might be like a total inner nerd, but I think that is all like super, super fascinating. <laughs> well, I'm so glad because I am <laughs> definitely an inner nerd. I've discovered that I am, people say that I get a little wonky. In fact, that's, that's usually what I have to do is, uh, is when I am editing my books as, is I go back and I take out the wonkiest the the parts where I really got into the weeds. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. So let's dive into the material of the book. So mm -hmm. the subtitle is The Evolution, Biology, and Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond. So let's kind of just follow that order. So um, tell us a little bit about the the evolution of friendship. Like let's let's start there. Yeah, so all of those things in the subtitle in fact are somewhat interwoven, but we can we can pick it apart a bit. So the evolution mm -hmm. side of the story is that um well it became really evident when scientists who watch animal behavior started to recognize that animals had these relationships that seemed to matter to them and to make a difference in their lives. And so in research in baboons and rhesus macaques and other species, uh, evolutionary biologists figured out that, that the animals, the individuals with the strongest positive bonds, um, essentially like in a baboon, that means like how often they're nice to each other, <laughs> essentially. Uh, the animals with the strongest positive bonds, <clears throat> they lived the longest and they had the most reproductive success, meaning that they had more and healthier babies, essentially. And, um, and that was really interesting because it's not what anybody expected. In evolutionary terms, that longevity and reproductive success are about as good as you can do. That's what everybody's after. And, mm -hmm. uh, and in non-human primates, the expectation was that dominance rank would matter most of all because they're very hierarchical. Most most uh, groups of of monkeys and apes are very hierarchical, and that was always thought to be probably the most important thing. So the fact that it wasn't that which animals were basically best at making and maintaining friends uh, was surprising and important and it was this moment when in science when the researchers who were watching these animals in Africa suddenly said hey wait a minute this isn't just about these animals this is about all of us and you know what they were trying to understand was why do why do animals live in groups why do humans live in groups we have mm. um always right and so what they have figured out is that we live in groups because it's good for us. <laughs> it's but we're more likely to survive. We're more likely to be saved from the lions and the leopards that are trying to eat us or, you know, and there are of course figurative lions and leopards in our lives today. Uh and it's it makes it easier to find food and you know, all kinds of things that living in groups gives us and human brains have evolved the complexity that they have in part in order to deal with the social complexity of their lives. So the, you know, the groups that we lived in got bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated. And you need a big brain to be able to keep track of all of those different people and their relationships to each other and their perspectives and things like that. And so that's not the only reason, but an important reason why our brains are as big and powerful as they are. And so from an evolutionary point of view, what you can say is that it hasn't just been survival of the fittest, which is the phrase mm. most people are familiar with. It's been survival of the friendliest. And that, you know, the, that there were real evolutionary advantages to being good at making strong, positive bonds. So making friends. And, you know, for a long time, scientists didn't think that they could talk about the word, use the word friendship when talking about animals, but they've changed their mind, most of them. Um, and, you know, it looks, if it looks like friendship, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's not the same as in humans, but it is the same in very fundamental ways that matter a lot. And, and so that work was one of the big, that's where some of the big breakthroughs in this new science of friendship have come from. So that's, that's the, the evolutionary part in a nutshell. There's more to it, but. 
So that that's really interesting. Did, did they distinguish between friends and and family? I don't know how easily you can mm. do that in the animal world, but is it is it actual, you know, you're not related friendship or is it just kind of more that that bond, whether you're technically family or not? It's both. And so what's really interesting about this science is that it does two things. It clarifies what friendship really is. It also blurs the lines between family and friends and mm-hmm. uh, and and sexual partners and things like that. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So it is true that most other animals like baboons uh, live, they spend a lot of their time with family members, with biological relatives. That's who's around. Uh, but what they found is that it's sort of that the exception proved the rule that even the animals who didn't have family around, who whose primary grooming partner say had been eaten by a lion, uh, if they then worked to make strong bonds with other animals, they could do fine um, mm. in terms of the longevity and the reproductive success. And what we find in humans is that it really makes a difference how socially integrated you are. But it doesn't have to be family members. It can be close friends. And that and the effect on your biological health is, um, and we'll get to this part when we talk about the biology, but is is really about the quality of the relationship and not the origin of the relationship, meaning whether it's family or friend or romantic, you know, interest. Uh it's is it it basically there's a simple definition or a, a minimum definition, let's call it, for friendship. And it's across species. And it is that the bond is long-lasting, it's positive, and it's cooperative. So in baboons, that looks like, you know, they've known each other a long time, they groom each other, they make each other feel good, and then they are there to look out for each other when it's necessary. You know, help find food or protect from predators or whatever it is. Same thing is true in humans. It's, it makes it look like, well, you can translate it into, so what does it mean to be a good friend? Well, it's to be a steady, reliable presence in someone's life, to make that person feel good, and to be helpful, to show up, to be reciprocal. Uh, you know, you help me, I help you. Not in a tit-for-tat accounting kind of way, but in a mm-hmm. general, over-the-length-of-the-relationship kind of way. Okay, yeah, because it, this is kind of a sad statement, but it's true that we're not, not everyone is friends that definition of friendship with their family members or even their romantic partners. So that's kind of a unique um, way to look at a, a certain type of bond or yeah, relationship. So this is a different way to slice it kind of is to say, mm-hmm. let's look at the quality of the relationship with whoever's in your life and not, and not how it is that you're connected to them. And so by that definition, your friends are the people who fit those that ha- with whom you have those strong positive bonds and then there's everybody else and we hope that your family and your romantic partner fit into that category but yes alas they do not always and you telling me that you have a sister or a, a husband or whatever it is a girlfriend doesn't actually tell me anything about the cat the quality of your relationship it just tells me about the legal or biological connection you have with that person Right. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so whereas if you tell me that somebody is your best friend, I know a whole lot about, you know, how you think of that relationship. Okay. All right. I want to get into the biology, but first I'm just super interested in the the long lasting part of that definition. Are there parameters around that? Okay, because like in today's society, so like I have my friends that I had in grade school and then kind of a different set in high school. And then I went to college and some of those people I'm still friends with now and others, not so much. So is it, does the long lasting mean like it's got to last the, the long haul or it's more kind of, it can come in and out of your life. And for a certain chapter of your life, it's long lasting within that chapter. Yeah. The latter. It does not have to be only people you've known your whole life. And in fact, one of the interesting things is that while sometimes those are the friends that we are closest to and, you know, stay that way, it's also true that sometimes there are people with whom we have a 
a really long shared history, but we don't actually get along all that well anymore, or we find them draining or demanding. Mm -hmm. And and yet we put up with it because we think that the good of our history outweighs the bad of how much it's not fun to hang out with them anymore. Um, and we shouldn't really do that. We We need the relationships need to meet all of the requirements today, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But it is true that, so it's this kind of balancing act. To to consider somebody a true friend, you do need to know them pretty well and you need to Mm -hmm. trust them. And that takes time. In fact, you know, there's a study that I cite in the book, somebody actually counted (laughs) the amount of time it takes to consider someone a friend And they found that it takes about 50 hours of time together to go from being an acquaintance to a friend and about 90 hours to consider someone a good friend and 200 hours to consider them a best friend. And those, that kind of time is not so hard to come by when you're a in high school or college and you're thrown Mm -hmm. in with a whole bunch of people exactly your age. And, you know, you get hours and hours and hours with them. And so you can build intense relationships, you know, in a matter of weeks or months, which is harder to, that's harder to do when you're an adult. You may, so maybe you make friends with people you work with, but there's plenty of people that we work with, you know, for 400 hours and we don't end up considering a friend. Uh, and that's fine. fine. So time is just one piece of it. But so it, to answer your original question though, it's definitely the case that you need that time to consider someone a friend, but it's also true that people come in and out of our lives and, and that's okay. We can, so there should be a kind of always be, well, let me put it this way. There should always be some people in your life that you've known a long time and that you feel know you, that you feel known and seen and understood by, and that you feel are there for you, but who they are might in fact you know, change with the decades or, you know, Mm -hmm. as you move or as you marry and have kids or, or don't marry and have kids or, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're going to find people who, um, who kind of travel with you through life. They call that a social convoy. And then, but some of those people will fall off or some of them Mm -hmm. will get sick or pass away, unfortunately, or, you know, um, it's, and so what matters again is the there has to be a certain amount of time for that long lasting element, but it doesn't mean that it's only the, you, you know, you can only really be good friends with the people you've known since you were 10. Right. And, and so it's true as they say that like you can outgrow a friendship and that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with anybody. Uh, exactly right. It's, uh, I, I do find a lot of people really struggle with this idea mm-hmm. of quitting friendships and, you know, look, r- human relationships are messy and I, I've begun to feel that people want me to give them some, some magic, um, spell <laughs> that they can cast <laughs> over a relationship to make it end without any pain. I can't do that. But what I can tell you is that it is Okay to feel that this relationship isn't serving you anymore. And really, if you have a a current friendship that doesn't feel fully healthy, the important thing to know is how much it matters that it's a positive thing and that unhealthy relationships really are not good for your biology. But the second thing is that then you, you have a couple of options, but you should act. You should either and have the hard conversation with your friend that you need to have about how to make the relationship better, work to make it better. And you can look at your own piece of it. You can end the relationship entirely if it's really toxic, or you could shuffle that person sort of to the outer circles of your social life, right? They don't have to be Mm -hmm. front and center. Um, The people closest to you should be the people who really, really have your back. Yeah, I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially in today's day and age when we're so connected. So there's no, there's no longer as much of like a natural break of, of ties maybe due to, you know, different stages of life because, you know, we've got the cell phones and the texting and the social media. And so it kind of keeps you connected when maybe, um, you know, without those connection components, maybe the, the relationship would have naturally fallen off. And then people 
feel even worse, even thinking like, oh, this relationship doesn't serve me anymore because it's so quote unquote old. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that um, we think that social media has changed so much about relationships and there's a lot that it actually hasn't changed. But one thing that has that, that, that it has done is it has made these relationships persistent. So Mm -hmm. it is, you know, you are tracked through life by the people you knew when you were a kid and went to high school with and college with, and, you know, um, and they're all on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you hang out. Um, by the time this airs, it'll be different, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but, you know, you, you have, those people continue in your life in a way that was rare before if you didn't just stay in the same town your whole life. Right. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and some people think that's a good thing and some people think that's a bad thing, but it's certainly a thing. (laughs) It's true. Right. And also even the fact that like our phone numbers tend to stay the same because now we're all Mm -hmm. on cell phones. Right. And so you carry it with you. So you're, you're sort of forever branded to the area where you grew up, where you got your first cell phone. Right. (laughs) I, I was talking to an editor the other day and the phone call looked, came in from Ypsilanti, Michigan. And I was like, I'm pretty sure she's not in Michigan, but okay. (laughs) And yeah, but it was her. I thought, is somebody else calling me right now at our appointed hour? But that's because she's carrying with her that same phone number for her whole life, right? Uh, And so things like that make you easier to find. You know, I happen to find it a positive. So for me, I feel like, yes, there's plenty of people from high school and college that I'm friends with on Facebook, but I have real, no real relationship with or don't actually enjoy the what they post and things like that. But I, I get the glass half full. I feel like there's a handful of people from the earlier parts of my life or from other early jobs that I love how they are on online. I think they're funny. They make me laugh or we're, we're both writers. And so we have a lot in common or we've, there's, you know, there's a couple of people from high school I'm closer to now in some ways, or I like better and know better because of our shared interest online than I did when we were in school. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and so I, I find it sort of a benefit. I feel like, you know, it's, and let me say that when you write a book about friendship and you tour the country, Oh, all those people come out. <laughs> you realize you have so many friends. I have so many friends. And it, it, social media was amazing. And they didn't just come to see me. They came to see each other. Like my high school friends, yeah. they had this big dinner and a whole big group of them came out. And it was because it, then it allowed, it was this rolling reunion. But um, I, I have no illusions. They weren't all coming. I mean, they, of course, they were excited that someone they knew had written a book about friendship. And, you know, it was interesting. But they got lured into coming out because they could all have dinner together and it was, it was going to be fun to see each other. And, and so, you know, social media made all that possible in a way that wasn't really possible for uh, before. And so I think that for me, that's been a real positive. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, there's some people I haven't talked to and, you know, 15, 20 years at this point, but I will see kind of what they're up to online. And I have no desire to necessarily reconnect that friendship, but it's more like, Oh, look at them. That's great. Like you just kind of feel happy for them. Um, so I, I try and live in the glass half full too, but I mean, there's certainly some, uh, glass half empty, uh, aspects of social media. Sure. Um, but let's jump into the, the biology of friendship. So why is this bond? Like, what is it doing to us? And like, Why is that a good thing? So the headline of what it's doing to us is that friendship is as important for your health as diet and exercise. And Mm. it is, it affects how long you live and it affects, and in this, let me say, I'm talking about the whole continuum of your social integration. So friendship on one side and loneliness on the other and social isolation, right? And so Mm -hmm. that, that factor of of your social life affects your cardiovascular functioning, your immune function. It makes you more or less susceptible to viruses and inflammation. It affects your risk of dementia, so your cognitive health, your risk of depression and mental health. It affects even the rate at which your cells age. And so it does all these things. How is it, right, that a social relationship, a friendship that exists entirely outside the body can get 
under the skin, as biologists say, and have mm-hmm. change your cells and change the way your genes express themselves and and how your hormones and neurotransmitters are fired. And so, well, it does. And, you know, we're still figuring out exactly what's going on, but it's all still part of the evolutionary question because what what evolutionary biologists do is they ask a series of questions about how something works and then deeper questions about why it should be that way. So this biology piece is the how. Like how is it that, you know, if I it can be anything from like what kind of visual attention do you need to be able to bring to bear on a relation like a, on a interaction with another individual. So does that mean like, you know, you meet up and I see your face, I recognize your face, I see that maybe you look happy or maybe you look sad or and then my brain can process your language that you use to talk to me. And there's those kinds of things. But then there's also the the idea that, for, uh, for instance, a friend, the presence of a friend can bring down your stress cortisol. The, the cortisol is the stress hormone, right? And that mm-hmm. level can come down when you're with a friend. And it's uh, it's all kinds of things like why would, so, and why why would it affect your, uh, your heart rate and your, in, your your resilience to inflammation. I, I have some, you know, we have some answers. We don't have all of them, but we know that it does. And so, that's the that's the sort of short term how. And then the why would be that deeper question of, well, in evolutionary thinking, if if we are designed, you know, if our bodies are designed to need to connect, then we need a sort of signal. It's because that's going to be good for us in the long haul, right? And so, for instance, what this means is that something like loneliness, which we now understand is a it's a subjective feeling that there's a mismatch between the amount of social connection you want and the amount of social connection you have. And when you feel lonely, your body is actually sort of warning you that you need more connection, you need more social connection. And if you don't get it over time, then you start to have these physiological problems. And it's be- so it's all tied in in a way that we did not understand before. Okay, this is so interesting. All right, so it makes sense because from an evolutionary standpoint, we as a species want to live on and continue and procreate and be alive. So that need for connection helps us stay together in groups, which then even from a physical standpoint and looking for food and all that stuff, we kind of talked, you mentioned in the beginning, like that's going to help us, um, help us stay alive. So I just, it, it makes sense. And it's also just such a mind blowing concept because it's just so smart. Like it's just so, so brilliantly done. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's it's not always the case that everything in evolution. Um, I mean, sometimes things evolve in ways that you know we don't love, uh, but they, but that's how it works. But you know, and and it is true. Let me be clear. I mean, there are some successful jerks out there, so it's not that yeah. the only <laughs> way to succeed is by being um, a friendly person. It means that it's a better, it's uh, the odds are better, right? Um, and that you and that you will do better um, if you are have that ability to make strong bonds and um, right. and to live that way, right? And which I think in this particular case is just such a lovely, it's such a lovely fact, as you say. It's like, oh well, how how nice is that? That it turns out that this thing that we love, hanging out with our friends, is really good for us and is important in our story as human beings, right? In a way that we never gave it credit for before. You know, we always have thought Mm -hmm. it was pleasurable. I mean, all the way back to Aristotle, but everybody thought it was cultural, not biological. And of course it is cultural. There are, there are these cultural overtones to it. I just, I think it's, I think, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, like evolution is playing the long game. So yes, like you could be a successful jerk and probably be just fine. But then in the long term, like looking at it with a long view, then like maybe you do procreate, but maybe your child decides not to because they had such a horrible relationship with you. Like I just, I think there you go. Like right. In the yes. long game, it, it works out. At, you know, evolution is playing a bigger game than we are, but it is interesting to know that in our 
you know, kind of short time here on this earth, it's, it's biologically better for us to have these connections. I'm just so interested in how though. So I'm going to take a little shot in the dark here with my limited scientific okay. knowledge. Go for it. Does this come into like the concept of epigenetics and how it's not like it versus the genetic determinism? Like it's not that, you know, our genes are just the way they are and we were all, you know, if we're genetically predispositioned for something that's a hundred percent going to happen, but it's more, there's other things going on usually with um, you know, our, our mind and the way we perceive the world and stress and all this stuff that is actually in charge of which genes do and don't get turned on, but we still don't really know how to even explain that. Yes, <laughs> that okay. is, wow. that is <laughs> good for you. Um, <laughs> we come into the world with the, the DNA that we have is like the blueprint for a life, right? But then you live your life. And there are some genes that that are determinant for sure, like your eye mm -hmm. color and things like that. It, it's not going to change, right? But your, but a lot of the genes that we come into the world with might or might not get turned on, as you say. They get expressed is the is the term that geneticists use. Um, but it's I, the analogy I use in the book is that they can be like an opinion that's never voiced. You know, they. They sit there and then it has everything to do with your environment. And now we understand that that includes your social environment and that, and your friendships and your relationships and that, that piece of it. So first, you know, everybody thinks of environment as well. Okay. It's what you eat or it's the air you breathe or things that seem more directly tied to your physical body. That's easier. That's an easier mental leap to make, right? right? But we did not understand for a long time that 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 this that gene expression was really the critical thing. That was where the rubber hits the road, right? It's like it's just it's not just the genes that you're born with. Uh, it's it's how they play out based on the experiences that you have in your life, um, mm -hmm. and. One objection people have to some of this science where they did have back in the day when it was getting going was this idea that, well, wait a minute, um, you're telling me that, you know, is this saying that some of our worst instincts actually can be explained by, um, by sociobiology, what, what E.O. Wilson and everyone talked about, like that, you know, if it's your genes making you do it, everything, including how you interact socially, well, but that's not a good thing because sometimes we don't like how we interact, right? And what the evolutionary biologists say is knowledge is power. And that we, just because we, you know, one of the, well, let me put it this way. One of the good things about humans is that we have the wisdom to recognize things in ourselves and then sometimes to, to counter them if we don't like them. Like, for instance, empathy. We now understand that there's a whole neuroscience of empathy which mm -hmm. is your ability to take someone else's perspective into account. I mean, there's a lot of elements to empathy at its most fundamental. It's a kind of shared, almost a shared physical response to something. Um, it's There's a cognitive empathy where like, I understand that you saw that that thing happened and, you know, it affects your, or that you have, you have a belief that might be different from my belief or something like that. And then there's compassion and the desire to actually act on, you know, on somebody else's behalf, but all of that is um, comes under the umbrella of empathy. There's also, though, a real in-group, out-group sort of natural, implicit bias that we that we bring to the world, and we have come to understand that much more of late, right? And and that's not a great thing. So it can be good because it helps us rally the people right around us, but it can be bad in that it pushes us to see you know, strangers as, as bad or, and that it's one of the causes for xenophobia, racism, mm -hmm. and all these other things that are not good. Uh, but understanding that we have that instinct, I think is useful because now like, let's not lie and pretend we don't <laughs> let's mm -hmm. address it head on. Right. So I'm, I'm getting a bit far afield here from friendship, but it's, it is this kind of interesting question of genes and epigenetics and environment and how they all work together. 
Yeah, no, I, I love that you bring up empathy. We talked about that with um, another guest. I had Dr. Austin Perlmutter on who wrote a book called Brainwash with his dad. And they were talking about the kind of the neuro, who's a neuroscientist or neurologist. And they were talking about the neuroscience behind decision making. And one of the, the big findings that, you know, when they wrote the book is he was really surprised by the power of empathy, empathy and how that, you know, helps kind of build up our prefrontal cortex, which then helps us make better decision making. So we talked about the different levels of empathy. And I, I love when I hear the same thing from very different guests, because it's like, oh, okay, yes. Yes, there legit. must be something to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so does, does the book or the research get into anything about um, how to, how to go about building these bonds? Like, is it something you can work towards, or I'm, I know you have to work to keep it going, but is there a reason or an explanation why we feel more, why we're drawn to certain people to be friends with and not others? Or is it really all a matter of like effort and time? Uh, no, it is. There is a, there isn't, I mean, there's a chemistry to friendship rather mm-hmm. like the chemistry in romance. Um, and you know, there are people that you just click with. And in fact, scientifically speaking, what friendship is all about is differentiation, meaning that I like you more than I like you. (laughs) And (laughs) sometimes it's because you really like the person better. Sometimes it's just that you know them better and you've had more time to get close, right? And you just didn't have that time for the other person. But sometimes you really just don't click in the same way. And it has a lot to do with similarity and shared interest. And that similarity piece gets back to that question of in-group and out-group. Like, you know, it is true that we have a tendency to have friends who are more like us. I mean, I have a lot of middle-aged white women friends who have creative jobs and teenage kids <laughs> because mm-hmm. we have a lot in common. We have a lot to talk about. We're likely to bump into each other, right? Right. But those are not the only friends I have. And that's important. This is where, you know, you can work to make sure that your friends, your your social world includes people who are not exactly like you or you or you don't. And, you know, I hope that most people will, but not everybody will. That similarity is a sort of fundamental piece of friendship. It's it um, it's also proximity matters a lot. So who who you're near. But in our day to day lives to like you know, as adults, things like shared interest and shared worldview actually matter a lot. Um, you know, it's just easier to be friends with someone who also loves to go to the theater or who, who also loves to go to Brooklyn Nets games, you know, um, and harder to be friends with someone with who wants to do nothing that you want to do. <laughs> um, which is one of the, I mean, this sounds like such basic corny, I think. But one of the things about adults making friends is that you really do need to sort of go look for the people who share your interests, you know, join. If you move to a new city and you have a new job, you got to look for like, it's the hiking club maybe that you care Mm -hmm. about or the, or maybe you're really into food. And so you want to join some sort of, um, you know, farm to table group or something. Um, I don't know, but that's, that's just a starting place, but there's a reason why that has worked so well for so long. It, and it is that, that having sharing, sharing interest matters and then worldview matters. So like volunteering is a really good way to make new friends. And because you're not coming together with the idea that you automatically will become friends, you're coming together around something that is of interest and matters to you both. And then you get to put in the time together while you do something. And then you maybe achieve a deeper connection or not, but it's a good place to start. And and it makes total sense, but it also is a little bit ironic tying back to like empathy, because if we make friends with people who have shared interests and shared worldviews, it's almost less of an opportunity to really practice and develop empathy as if we had more diverse viewpoints and interests within our life. So it's just that's it's that's it's interesting true, how that although works. Although it's also true, it depends which way you look at this. Because, for instance, you know, I live in Brooklyn, in New York City, and so I have a very in in many ways, I have more in common with the people who 
live in Brooklyn, whatever race or ethnicity, you know, religion they are, because we've made a choice to live in a place that sort of throws us together. And you, and you have a certain worldview. I have more in common with them maybe than I do with someone who lives in a gated community in a really rich white suburb. Right. And even though I'm a middle-class white person, right. I'm, you know, so, so it isn't automatically, sometimes you have to Again, you sort of slice it up differently. Well, but where are your similarities? Who are you similar to? It's not always going to be people who look exactly the same as you. It might be that your worldview brings you together in a more fundamental way. Gotcha. Yeah. And there's there's many different worldviews. Like there's a ton of different perspectives. Yeah, it's not just there, liberal so, yeah. and conservative. That's just an easy example. And it's, of course, what is uh, obsessing a lot of our country right now. Uh, right. But not like to your point, like neighborhoods is a, is a good one. I mean, that's even the case here in Jacksonville, Florida, we have very kind of distinct neighborhood stages of life. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a, a young mother versus, you know, your single friends, like all of that changes your, your world view in a, in a way. It does. And it is, it is good though. And important that people try to see outside of themselves and like make, like, so for instance, if you get married, or you have a kid, it's a, you're going to automate. I mean, it, when you have children, if you have children, it's really helpful to have friends who also have children the same age. You really need them <laughs> because they know exactly what you're going through. You can share information, you can share, you know, um, but it's good to try not to leave your other friends behind entirely. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and people are sort of famous for that and for putting their friends, their old friends last then when life changes, when we have these transitional moments and some of that is fair and some of it is, you know, we should do better. Right. So that's kind of the, the balance. You need friends who are in similar life situations as you for that support. So you feel like you're not alone, so they can absolutely relate. But then to your point, friends who may be aren't in that same stage, like then there's your opportunity to really practice empathy and understand where they're coming from and vice versa so that you can maintain that closeness. Right. Exactly. Gotcha. Oh, I love it. Super interesting stuff. I can't thank you enough for, for coming on. I just, I think it's great. I love what you're doing. Um, you've definitely inspired me to rethink my writing strategy and maybe start to dabble into the science stuff. Cause I do, <laughs> I find it all super interesting. Um, tell everybody where they can buy the book, find you and your work, follow you, all of that good stuff. Yes. Uh, so the best place to find me is LydiaDenworth.com. My website will take you to everything else. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. I'm beginning to beef up my Instagram presence. I'm on Facebook at Science Writer Lydia. Um, and you can buy the book wherever books are sold, but unhappily in the time of this pandemic, that's not very many places. Yeah. <laughs> um, so really it's Amazon and bookshop.org is a uh, a new site that is um, where you can buy books from independent booksellers, but online. So I highly oh, recommend cool. people check that out, bookshop.org. Uh, but, you know, barnesandnoble.com, anywhere you can find it. And I hope you will. And I hope you'll write, you'll review and, you know, say nice things and <laughs> check it out. <laughs> and and I really hope people understand that this new science is really a, what it does that's lovely is it gives you permission to hang out with your friends and not to feel in the least like you should be doing something else instead. Yes, which is a very good, that is a great point to end on. Like it is biologically good for us, our lives, and the continuation of our species that we have front time. Exactly. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Casey. Take care. Stay well. Yes, you too. All right. That'll do it for today's episode. I hope you all enjoyed that. Thank you again for listening Please make sure that you are subscribed so you don't miss future episodes as well as maybe just future non-episode episodes where I kind of just get on there and talk about my journey and what's going on. If that's something you're interested in listening to, then those might be coming more in the future as well. If you enjoyed this episode or have been enjoying the podcast in general, then please, please, please take two minutes to leave a rating or write a short review on whatever platform you are listening to. And honestly, actually the best thing you can do is send to a friend. 
I mean, most of the podcast I've come across in my life was a friend sending him to me and then I liked it and kept listening. And so if you want to help support me and the podcast and help the podcast grow, then sending episodes to friends is probably the best way to do it. And I would just so appreciate that. You can also follow the podcast on the socials, the better you podcast, um, on Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to reach me, you can always email me at the better you podcast at gmail.com. All right. That's it. Thank you all for listening and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.